pardon the 90s reference, but hopefully all the girlies are on standby because today we're rolling in a 5.0. This is the 2024 Mustang GT with, yes, a 5-liter Coyote V8 under the hood. If you want to know about the EcoBoost Mustang, that video is already on the channel. That'll be the one that'll start around $31,000. But if you want the ultimate classic Mustang feel, you want the 5 liter V8, and that's going to be the GT version. Let's talk about the styling first. Obviously, the front end looks pretty similar between the EcoBoost and the GT, but we do find a different grill insert right over here with these separate intake sections. Slightly more cooling going on in the GT and a different lower bumper treatment, but we get basically the same tri-module LED headlights with the progressive of turn signals. I think that's a really cool look and I like what Ford has done generally with the design of the Mustang. They're calling this the seventh generation Mustang but really I guess you could say it's maybe generation six and a half because a large amount of the structure is at least very very similar to the outgoing Mustang and there are a few parts on the inside that are pretty similar as well. Ford calls it a seventh generation Mustang because they tweaked just about everything. The 5 liter V8 makes more power, they changed some parts on it to make it more durable as well. The 2.3 liter EcoBoost has a ton of changes, new turbos, new heads, etc., new injection system. And of course, we have the new sheet metal on the outside, tweaked suspension as well, improved braking all the way around also. Let me know what you think about the more angular design theme that we find in the Mustang. I really think this is the best looking Mustang so far, although I know classic Mustang fans would disagree. This is about the same size as the outgoing model, so certainly smaller than the Dodge Challenger, which is not going to exist for 2024. Both the Challenger and the Camaro are going to end production right around the end of this year, making the Mustang really stand alone in this segment. You could cross shop this with something like a Toyota Supra or a Nissan Z or an 86 or a BRZ, but this is very different than most of those, especially versus the Supra and the Z where we don't have a back seat back there. This is of course classic American muscle with a naturally aspirated V8 engine and rear wheel drive, six speed manual or 10 speed automatic. Out back, we definitely see a much more modern design theme versus the outgoing model with this really aggressive cut line here in the trunk lid. Let me know what you think about that. I see equal parts classic Mustang and maybe a little bit of Hyundai Elantra in here as well with this sort of karate chop going on right here in the back. It definitely accentuates the progressive turn signals and gives it much more of an angular Chevron theme. Since this is the GT, of course we have a wing on the back, GT logo rather than the pony on the rear, and quad exhaust tips rather than the dual exhaust tips that we find in the EcoBoost trim. Production of both the Challenger and the Camaro are going to end at the end of 2023, and that means that the Mustang is really standing alone in the pony car space that it created 60 years ago, essentially. You could cross shop this with something like a Toyota 86 or a BRZ or I guess a Supra or a Nissan Z. Those might be a bit more rational but none of them are like the Mustang. Sure, a Z will give you 400 horsepower, but it's from a three liter twin turbo V6 that doesn't have the kind of power output profile that we find in a big naturally aspirated V8. Now, since this is the GT model, of course, we have the wing on the back, we have the quad exhaust tips down below, but the rest of the design is pretty similar to the EcoBoost, except of course we have GT right there rather than the Mustang logo. And then we have the same sort of karate chop profile here in the middle on the trunk lid. This gives me equal parts classic Mustang and Hyundai Elantra, if I'm pretty honest, with this really aggressive karate chop here. It really accentuates these Chevron-like turn signals though. You can really see that from the side. Under the hood, we have the legendary 5.0. This is the latest version of the Coyote 5 liter V8. It produces 480 horsepower, 415 pound-feet of torque. If you get the performance exhaust, you get a six horsepower bump and a slight torque increase as well. You can send power to the rear wheels via your choice of a Jetrag six-speed manual transmission or a Ford 10-speed automatic transmission. Obviously, the manual is going to be the most fun, but the 10-speed automatic is going to be the quickest zero to 60. For $41,500 plus destination, that's a really good horsepower deal for the cash. If you want more power though, that's the Dark Horse, and of course, there are gonna be later versions of the Mustang we all know coming up soon, but the Dark Horse is gonna bump power up and it's gonna replace the Jetrag manual with a Tremec six-speed manual. That is likely going to be a little bit quicker, zero to 60. I also like the way that transmission feels, but we can talk about more of that uh, next week when I'm actually driving the Dark Horse in North Carolina. So this week is EcoBoost and GT, Next week is Dark Horse, then probably in a few months, we're gonna start getting even higher performance versions of the Mustang. 
Now let's check out the sound of the 5 liter V8. Of course, we have an active exhaust, so first things first, I'll cycle through the exhaust modes. First, let's check out the quiet exhaust. It's actually pretty quiet for a 480 horsepower engine. Let's go for normal, definitely a little bit more of a burble, definitely throatier. And then, of course, we have the track mode. That's going to be the loudest. And yeah, that definitely sounds really Go ahead and hop on in here with me so we can take a look at the seats. There are essentially two main seat designs. This is the Recaro seat. There's also the Ford seat available. I do find the Ford seat more comfortable. It's not as bolstered as this, but it does have adjustable lumbar support. You also can get a powered design in that seat and seat heating and ventilation. None of those are available on the Recaro. So you're trading all of this extra bolstering for that extra adjustability and extra comfort. As far as size goes, for me at six feet tall and about 180 pounds or so, these seats are definitely snug on my sides. So if you're a bigger person than I am, you should definitely think hard about those four seats, uh, the Ford seats, I should say. Getting into the back is relatively easy. We have one lever there, and then you do have to manually slide the seat forward if you want it to go a little further forward. And then back here, we find a relatively tight accommodation. But there is a big difference between the Recaro seats and the Ford seats back here in the rear as well. The shape of this seat is a little bit different. You'll notice that this seat kind of looks like a five-point harness seat, but it's actually not five-point harness capable. If you want a five-point harness, you're gonna need a different seat. This is just a styling touch up there. This is the release handle. And then down here in this area, we don't have as much of a legroom carve out. And you'll really notice that if I try and scoot over here, to the passenger side. This is a four seat vehicle, so no middle seat back here in the rear. And you can see my knees are really digging into this seat back with the front seat more or less adjusted for me, plus uh, maybe about an inch of further travel forward to accommodate me in the back. Not a lot of headroom is going on back here. On the other hand, these seats are certainly bigger and more accommodating than what we see in the BRZ or the Toyota 86 and infinitely more accommodating than the Supra or the Z's back seats because they don't have back seats. Here, you could put a child seat forward facing, rear facing, definitely out of the question, but you could probably put a forward facing child seat here as long as the kid wasn't too tall and didn't have legs that were too long. The rear seats, of course, fold down in a 50-50 fashion, really improving that cargo practicality. And honestly, that's probably what most folks are gonna do. So you could put things like your spare set of wheels and tires in here. You should be able to put four wheels in here for your track day. Um, I wouldn't put them on the seats, of course, but you could definitely use these as padded cargo areas as well. The majority of the Mustang interior is the same regardless of the engine you choose. But if you get the 5 liter V8, we can get a manual transmission, so obviously the shifter is going to be different, and that's what this model has. Even the base version of the Mustang has the same two LCDs in the dashboard that we find in this model, but they're not part of the same binnacle arrangement. We actually have two different pods in the base model, even though it uses the exact same LCDs, just over 12 inches for the instrument cluster, just over 13 inches for that big infotainment system there. Then the rest of the interior changes basically based on the trim. There are a few different interior color options, and then there are two different interior grade options. This has the high level interior, and it has the Recaro seats. You can see the Recaro logo right there on the seats that we talked about earlier. Lots of bolstering on those seats, both for the seat back and the seat bottom cushion. These are perforated leather upholstered, but they're not ventilated. This particular model has the optional stripey shoulder belts. You can also get red shoulder belts, etc. But probably the biggest thing you're gonna notice versus the previous generation of the Mustang is that even though some of these shapes look very familiar, if we actually look closer there, you'll notice that we get more premium materials. So soft touch materials on the upper section of the doors, stitched materials there for the mid section of the doors, and then hard plastics only really down there at the bottom of the door, right around that bottle holder. Moving over to the dashboard, we find this sort of, I guess, mag light theme right here to this trim. It is an attractive look Mustang right there in the middle passenger air vent integrated into there and you can see that we have carbon fiber-esque trim both on the doors and on the dash there a stitched midsection these are the components that really help dress up the interior versus the previous model so soft touch upper soft touch stitched middle hard plastics lower on the dashboard pretty big glove compartment right there maybe a 10 inch tablet computer could fit inside i suspect something like a 12 or 13 would not fit Speaking of 13, that's the size of the big LCD right here in the middle that is standard. As you can see, it supports wireless or wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. 
and that smartphone integration will occupy the entire screen. The screens in this vehicle are highly customizable. If you want to know more about that, I take a deep, deep dive in a separate video where I take a look at all the various themes and uh, color schemes that go on with this system. Uh, shortly here though, let's go uh, over it quickly. We have this Mustang button right here that goes over to the My Mustang selection in the infotainment screen. Sorry about those options that are popping up there. That allows us to change the cluster theme so you can see what it looks like over here. Normal, sport, track, calm, and of course, Fox body. Fox body is definitely my favorite. Let's take a look at that right there. And it does change at night. Unfortunately, if I turn on uh, the headlights, it's not dark enough outside, but it does look like a 1990s Fox body with the sort of blue green gauge faces. That's a pretty cool look. We also get really excellent animations as we scroll through the various drive modes right there. That's all part of the upgraded hardware and upgraded software that we find in this system. Below the infotainment system, we find the engine start stop button, physical controls for the volume and power. These are a combination of touch and physical buttons for a few system functions. And we have a wireless charging mat there, the six speed manual transmission. And here you can see some of the improved materials that are available in the Mustang. This is not standard, but we have a stitched center console that really dresses up this interior more than I thought. The actual shapes are pretty similar uh, versus the last generation Mustang. You can actually see down here, we have a softly padded area for your leg to rest there. Uh, but the feel of this better material really improves the interior vibe. Back here, we have basically the same storage compartment we had before. It is relatively small. The steering wheel, that's a new design. It has a flat bottom, sport grips up top. If you get the automatic transmission, paddle shifters are back here, but they're not standard. You actually have to get a package on the EcoBoost in order to get those paddle shifters. But the rest of the wheel looks pretty similar. Over here, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, lane centering. These are the drive mode toggles right here. You can toggle between the drive modes up and down. Over here, we have a button to change the steering profile of the vehicle, track forward, backward, volume up, down, and then these three buttons in a row refer to that multifunction cluster there. But most of the cluster settings are actually now configured in the infotainment system. That makes an awful lot more sense. All right, everybody, it's time to get the GT out on the road. And just because we didn't have enough time together in England, so we were in England for a whole week together, I have Tommy Mike from TFL Car here, uh, Mr. Mustang fan, right? Alex, thanks for having me. Yeah, I have been known to like a Mustang or two, but... Who doesn't? Yeah, new generation, 2024 Mustang. Now, yeah, new generation. I talked on this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, what is the definition of a new generation Mustang, really? Because this has a lot in common with the outgoing one, including honestly the road feel I think yeah I mean I've spent some time behind the wheel of it now and I have to say the way that the the vehicle transitions through turns um, the steering weight the front end grip feels mighty close to the old one mm -hmm. which I actually don't have a problem with because I think the old one was fantastic already I do like the way that Camaro right there that's passing by I like the way the Camaro drives a little bit more than the Mustang but I don't like anything else about the Camaro compared to this what do you think of this uh, fourth generation Coyote V8 Definitely got a lot of pep, and I like the linearness of the power. It's that classic, naturally aspirated V8 feel. You know, no turbo lag, no turbo bog, uh, no low-end torque like a turbo would have, of course, either. This loves to rev. You know, it revs all the way up to 7,500 RPM. It actually is fantastic. Let's see if I can find the right gear to uh, demonstrate some of those sounds. Um, it definitely sounds really great as it's revving high. It has. It has a really great character and personality. Now, this car is available with the $1,200 performance exhaust, and then you have four variations of exhaust sound. So let's see which one you're in. You're in the quiet one, Alex. I am in the quiet one. But just for giggles, let, let's try the loud one just for a sec. Yeah, really it noticeable is. difference. And this is very lively in the rear, of course. You know, 480 horsepower, I mean, it's only at 5,500 RPM there. And you could feel the rear end starting to wiggle around a bit on this road. This is not a, a high speed road. Of course, it's a public road, so we're not gonna do anything crazy here. Um, but should we be on a track, we could go zero to 60 in about four seconds with this uh, engine and the 10 speed automatic transmission. What's your guess for the manual transmission zero to six time? I'm guessing maybe four and a half. I would imagine right around mid fours, exactly yeah. right. Now you uh, can select a mode in the infotainment here to engage auto rev matching. Mm -hmm. So if you want those perfect downshifts, that's super easily accomplished. And they're really good. They're really, really good, yeah. Um, and you know, Alex, the thing about the Mustang is, um, 
you know, ever since 2015, this car has evolved so much into more of a handling machine. It has. The older solid axle cars, right, you've got the bosses, and they were pretty good, but this car is transformed in 15. I feel like it's been a pretty slow evolution since 2015, though. That's true, but they keep getting better and better and better, and this reminds me a lot of a V8 uh, BMW M car, to be honest. You know, that slightly heavier weight up front, because the engine's obviously pretty big versus the EcoBoost, but, uh, I mean, honestly, I have this suspicion that the, the chassis tuning and the design of this independent rear suspension was modeled after some BMW coupes, which is probably not a bad thing to, you know, model after. Now, let's talk about the Magna Ride suspension, which is optional in these cars. Is that mm -hmm. something you would spec? I am a little bit torn. I like the Magna Ride in general terms. The ride quality on the, uh, the highway was not as good as the steel sprung EcoBoost we drove yesterday. Uh, it was a little on the rougher side. But more than that, I dislike the lack of configurability that we get in this thing. If I go over here to this custom mode, trying not to do that while driving, obviously, and you know, you notice you're in ba profile based on normal, a da normal dampers is all you get. So if you, you can't have the sport throttle and the sport this and the sport that, or the track this and that with softer dampers or harder dampers, I think that's actually really a misstep because a lot of people think that you know when you're on a track, you must have the firmest suspension tune. Not every track, not every autocross course is gonna be right for really ultra firm dampers. And I want some of the other profiles with the, not necessarily soft soft, but something not as rock hard. So this car has a performance package. Mm -hmm. it gives you the 275 Pirelli tires, gives you six piston brakes, um, you know, obviously we have the Tours Unlimited slip diff in the rear. The brakes are fantastic. The brakes are fantastic. Is it worth the $3,000 plus upgrade for the performance package? I would get the performance package. I would get the Highline interior. Uh, if I wanted to save money, I would skip the active exhaust. It sounds really good without it. It does sound better with it, but I, I could skip that to save some money. I wouldn't get the Night Pony package, which that car behind us has, because you know I, the blacked out look is kind of cool, but it's a little expensive for some black logos. And I hate to say it, Alex, I would probably skip the Recaros. I would skip the Recaros too. I talked about that earlier in the video. See, secondary opinion here, the regular seats, I think they're just more comfortable. If you are gonna track your car every weekend and you are a track fiend, Recaros every day. If you're driving your Mustang the way most Mustang drivers would drive, spiritedly out on a winding road like this on a vacation, daily commuting, regular seats every time. 100%. Yeah, I mean, look, I have no upper body strength to discern of, and <laughs> even my string bean figure is really about as thick as I'd want to be in these seats. That's true, that's true. Yeah, and I talked about that earlier too. Yeah, if you're much wider than we are, um, you know, that's, that is going to be a problem. At, that said though, these definitely have a nice hugging feel on this road surface. We're not driving this at, you know, even eight tenths on this road, um, but they do have a nice stable planted feel here. You'd be sliding around a bit more in the regular seats. Now I will say too, if you do want to have fun on these roads, the coupe is the way to go. Yes. I was driving that convertible earlier um, and, and the rigidity just isn't really there for some spirited right. driving regularly. I mean, obviously it'll do it, but it's if, not wet noodle, but it's, it's not. It's not wet noodle, but it's not firm noodle. Right. It's um, al dente noodle. Yes. Um, yes. And I, I, you know, the, the stiffness that you get in the coupe is, is the way to do it. Yes, that's true. And you know, the coupe is going to be a little bit quieter as well. Um, but you know, if you're renting that car in Florida, it's gonna be convertible all the way. You're right, 100%. Now, according to Ford, fuel economy is a little bit better than last year. Uh, 17 miles per gallon combined is what this one's rated for, and it still has a gas guzzler tax. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, there were probably things they could have done in this new generation to avoid that through electrification, right? Through eliminating the V8, which a lot of people thought they were going to. But I have to say, I think it's worth it because going forward, Challenger's ending production at the yep, end of this year. I would agree, yeah. Camaro is going away. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the last American yep. brands that still offers a naturally aspirated V8 and a manual transmission, and that's pretty special. Yeah, and if the rumors are to be believed, uh, you know, Camaro might come back as an EV, and Challenger will come back with an inline six, so not quite what we're seeing today. Yeah, pretty uh, pretty radical differences. Yeah, and you know, Supra Z, Turbo V6, Turbo inline six, and, you know, of course, the, the Toyota and the Subaru, uh, the 86 and BRZ, you know, the boxer engine thing, which is not this kind of level of power, fun, refinement, any of those sorts of things. Those are great little track cars. This is a fantastic big track car. 
Yeah, I mean, and if you do want to carry four passengers, especially in the convertible, there's not a lot of four passenger convertibles on the market. Yeah, and you guys jam four people in that convertible all day long. Well, I wouldn't say all day long, but for <laughs> some of the day long, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah it's not bad. You survived. We say. survived. No one was happy. This you car, survived. I'd be very unhappy with That's the That's true. Yeah, but the and convertible. It's a lot, the Recaro seat's definitely a problem for the back seat, as we mentioned earlier. Definitely a problem, yeah. But um, look, overall, Alex, I think that the dynamics on this car are improved over the previous generation, if not slightly. The experience is definitely still there with that fantastic Coyote V8. Uh, price is getting a little hefty in some of these higher end specs. That's true. But I would say, as far as the on-road driving portion goes, this is pretty much exactly what I had expected from the Mustang, and I had expected modest incremental improvements over the previous generation. I think that's exactly what we see here. Of course, another big reason to get the Mustang over the competition is the convertible part. If you want the convertible, it's gonna be about $39,000 for the EcoBoost base convertible, about $52,500 for the base GT convertible that you see right here. Now, this one obviously is not the base model. It has the Night Pony package and a number of other options, so this one as equipped is about $62,000, but you can get that ragtop version if you want. That is something that we've never seen on the Dodge, and you don't find on the BRZ, Toyota 86, Supra, or of course the Nissan Z either. And that is definitely a reason to get the Mustang over the competition. Let's take a closer look at this particular convertible. I will go ahead and hop in on the other side so you can all see the interior differences here. Uh, essentially, we just have the power top. Go ahead and start this one up. You can, of course, get the convertible with the six-speed manual transmission. Definitely a great touch there. Control is right up here for the power roof. We just unlatch it and then uh, hit the button. There we go, if I can find the button. And uh, the uh, roof pops back there into the trunk area, giving us a slightly smaller trunk than we find in the regular model. So you get about 13 cubic feet of storage space in the regular coupe. In the convertible, that drops down to just under, or sorry, just over 10 cubic feet. You see there's actually quite a lot of stuff back here in the rear, so still a reasonable amount of storage capacity. That is, of course, because the top has to go somewhere, and that somewhere is the front part of the trunk area. Now, if you come in here and take a look at these seats, you can see the difference in design between these seats and the Recaro seats. In addition to being heated and ventilated, these seats have the four-way ratchet style headrests, and there's definitely a bit more of a carve out for a rear passenger's knees and their legs under the seat. So if you do plan on actually using the back seats, you really might want to skip the Recaros. Now, it's not gonna be a problem with the convertible because apparently, at least for the moment, you can't get the Recaros in the convertible. Let me know what you think about the pricing for the convertible. It's not a bad deal. It seems about five grand more than a comparably equipped GT. In the GT lineup, you can only get the convertible in premium trim. You can't get the base model, so the interior is gonna be a little bit different. The base version of the GT is gonna have that two separate screen setup rather than the single pane view that we find in this model. But the convertible Mustang is probably the most iconic version of the Mustang. So I've always been surprised that not a lot of the competition offers a ragtop. If you want to get your hands on the new Mustang GT, these should be on dealer lots right around the time that you're watching this video. And the base price is going to be essentially $44,090 plus tax title and license. But that does include destination. That's obviously higher than the last Mustang GT, but I think it's still pretty reasonable when you consider what you're getting for that dollar. You're getting the six speed manual, you're getting the five liter V8, and the upgraded interior with those big dual screen systems in the dashboard. If you want to know more about that two screen setup, again, be sure and check out the video that I did dedicated just to infotainment. Compared to the competition, you'll get more power for your dollar in the Mustang GT. Now, I would probably add the interior upgrade kit, the Highline trim package on the inside. I do like the way that dresses up the interior. And I would probably add the performance package as well. That gives you the limited slip rear differential, which is gonna be essential if you wanna get the most out of the engine in terms of acceleration, especially with the manual transmission. And we get the absolutely massive Brembo brakes that we find on this model. This particular vehicle here, of course, has Pirelli P0 tires on it, 255s up front. Out back here, we get 275s, and even at 275s, you really want the limited slip differential to just harness the power in the rear. These are pretty big, pretty meaty tires, and the brakes are even bigger as well. So if you really want to track your Mustang GT on occasion, you can definitely do that with the performance package. Actually, I would argue you could probably do it occasionally with the regular brake package if you didn't mind changing your rotors and pads out now and then. 
Obviously, the biggest thing I love about the Mustang is that it still exists, and the Camaro and the Challenger are taking at least a year off. We know the Challenger is likely going to come back a little sooner than the Camaro. We don't really know what the Camaro's future is. And to be realistic, this has never been the same thing as the Challenger anyway, so it still stood alone in its previous generation, just as it does now, because the Challenger is bigger, it's more comfortable. Of course, we had the absolutely bonkers supercharged V8 available, but its back seat was absolutely enormous. It was bigger than some mid-sized sedans. This does not have that kind of back seat. It is still more practical than not having a back seat like the Supra or the Nissan Z, but it's not the world's most accommodating back area, especially if you get the Recaro seats where it does appear that you lose a little bit of room in the rear. Let me know what you think about the Mustang GT and what options are you interested in? Do you still want the six speed manual transmission, even though again, that Tremec that you find in the Dark Horse is gonna be more fun. Of course, the Dark Horse is also going to be a lot more expensive. Again, I would get one that's around $51,000. I think that is a really good deal for all of the features and functions that you would get. I am really torn on the active exhaust. I love the fact that it can get quiet if you don't want to wake your neighbors, and it can get bonkers loud if you want that in the track mode as well. The extra six horsepower, that doesn't really matter to me at all, but I do love the sound profiles that we get. And of course, the five liter V8 sounds fantastic compared to the Supra. That sounds good, it just has a different sound. This I think is better, definitely better than the Nissan Z as well. Light years different, of course, than the Toyota 86 and the Subaru. Those are theoretically direct competitors to the EcoBoost version of the Mustang, but I think the Mustang is quite simply better. Stay tuned for even more powerful versions of the Mustang coming soon. We all know that Ford is not gonna stop at the dark course, even though they have this segment entirely to themselves. And I would also say, if you are shopping for a BMW 4 Series or even a Mercedes two-door coupe in this price range, put this on your shopping list. 4 Series, 2 Series, I would get the Mustang. The biggest drawback for the Mustang in the past had been its interior, both in terms of technology, in terms of fit and finish, and in terms of the parts quality. The fit and finish, it's a little better than last time, the parts quality and the electronics light years ahead of the last Mustang, even though some of the shapes are very similar. So let me know what you think about all that, and especially, would you get BMW 2 Series or would you get a Mustang? I actually know someone that is involved in that particular decision-making process right now, and I would tell him, get the Mustang GT. I think it is quite simply better. See all of you later.